of you know who Lori Ault? Okay. <laughs> well, somebody, Brother Harvey's not here this morning, and somebody's going to have to be that bass line and for us to go, oh, that, I, that. Somebody, <laughs> somebody has got to come out with that bass line this morning. I would really like to come out and give you a mic because we, sometimes we don't come in with all that because we're waiting on that bass line. Mm -hmm. So y'all, we really need help with this song. This is our, one of our preacher's favorite songs. And I want to do it because it talks about the cross. And we all are going to learn it together. We may not do it perfect, but I hope we can get that all that I have in. <laughs> so if y'all can uh, try to get that, somebody sing that bass line so that we can get that in. Like I said, Brother Harvey was supposed to be here, but he's not here. <laughs> So we're going to need some help. All right. We're just going to do the best we can. And they've already told me I have to turn around. <laughs> Good, I heard you out there. They just wouldn't let me turn around. They said, oh, no, do not turn around. All right, thank you, uh, Sister Christy and choir. Uh, that is my favorite Stamps Baxter song. Yeah. I, I, I really like it. It kind of has a little beat to it. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and not only that, it's a great message. He bore it all that I might live. You understand, ever, do you ever just stop and think, what if Jesus hadn't come? What if he hadn't died? What if God had just said, okay, uh, all of you that are perfect enough, uh, you know, uh, you might make it into heaven. Wouldn't that be a sad, a sad way to live? Because you know what, I know I'm, I'm not near perfect enough. If God had just left us to figure out how to get to heaven on our own, we'd all die, or we'd all be lost. But thank God he bore it all that I might live and that you might live. And in, in Christ we have life. Not we have a better life here, but we also have life eternal. And for that we should be truly, truly thankful uh, today. It is good to see each of you here. I welcome you to our services today. And uh, if you're our guest today, we, uh, we are especially glad that you've come to be with us. And we just invite you to, to make yourself right at home here with us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and, uh, and we'll sing some more together. Father, I just want to pause this morning and just uh, 
thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation that you have given us. Father, without it, without it, we would be hopeless. We would be miserable. We'd be lost. But you gave us this free gift. It's ours just for, for the asking. And all we have to do is, is put our faith and trust in Jesus, who paid the great price uh, for our sins. And so, Father, just uh, draw us close to you today. Give us uh, cheerful hearts. Give us thankful hearts. And, uh, and let us give you the praise and the honor today that you so, so uh, much deserve. We thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
music service today. You know, I got up this morning and looked out the window, and the sun was up, and the flowers were blooming, and uh, it just looked like this beautiful, wonderful spring day, until I opened the door. <laughs> and I went, whoa, is, is, it, is it winter or spring? I, I'm not sure, but you know what? Uh, it'll be okay, and I'm glad, I'm glad that you're here. It is time for us to receive our offering. If our ushers will come, we'll get ready to do that. And uh, God was uh, once speaking to the nation of Israel through the prophet Malachi. And uh, he asked the nation of Israel a simple question, and it was, will a man rob God? Is it possible? Is it possible for us to rob God? Well, God said, yes, Israel, you, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. And so God, God expects us to show appreciation to him for his goodness in our lives by giving a small portion of what he's blessed us with back to him. And uh, that's uh, what he asks of us. But not only should we think of it as a request, we should think of it as a, really a privilege and an opportunity to say, God... Thank you, thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And so as we receive the offering this morning, let's just thank God. Thank God for all that he's done for us. Uh, Bruce, would you word our prayer for us this morning? Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for members and our great leaders, Lord. I really pray they're blessing upon each one, each Lord, let them be with those that can't be here for whatever reason, Lord. Just bless them and ask your help. We ask you, Lord, for these people. I want to tell you about something that happened a long, long time ago. It was back uh, kind of at the birth of our nation, April the 18th, 1775. Uh, the British had brought their army to old Boston, and they had made plans in the middle of the night to take some small boats and 
across the Charles River and attack uh, Concord and Lexington. And uh, that night, everyone was asleep as the British uh, made their plans, except for at least one man. One man was awake that night. He became aware of what the British were up to, and uh, he made his famous ride. His name was Paul Revere, and Paul Revere got on his horse, horse and he began uh, to gallop from, from village to village and from house to house, and he began to cry, Wake up! Wake up! The British are coming! The British are coming! And so candles were lit and windows were opened and curtains were thrown back. People got up and rubbed their eyes and they got dressed and they grabbed their muskets and they went out into the streets to defend their honor and their country and their children. And so Paul Revere sent out a call. And what was his call? Wake up. Wake up. The British are coming. Now there's another war that's going on. It's going on even today. It's an invisible war. It's a war between good and evil. It's a war between God and the devil. It's a war between the demons and, and the powers of darkness and us. And what we need today is uh, some modern day Paul Revere's that would go out and say to the Christians in this country, wake up, wake up, the enemy is coming, he's here, and if we don't get up and do something, we're going to lose our honor, we're going to lose our country, we're going to lose our family. And so we need to wake up, right? But the sad thing is, the church seems to be asleep, all snuggled up in her blankets, right, all covered up, uh, asleep, uh, sanctuaries are dark, and everybody's just comfy. When are we going to wake up? How bad does our country have to get? How weak do our churches have to become before we Christians wake up and sound the alarm? And that's what Paul is speaking to us about in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. And let's, let's read what uh, was written there. Romans 13, 11, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime not in the orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The late Vance Havner said this about today's world. He said there's anarchy in the world, apostasy in the church, and apathy in the pew. Anarchy in the world. I don't think I, don't think I have to prove to you today that, that our world is in a mess, especially when it comes to morals and to spirituality and just, just treating each other decently, right? And I, I could cite all kinds of examples, but I'm not. I think we, we're all very aware that our world is not what it used to be. The United States is not what it used to be. People today are not, they don't think the way that they used to think. And so our world is in a mess. God is becoming less and less and less relevant in the lives of people. Man, even, even like two-thirds of the people who claim to be Christian don't believe in anything called absolute truth. 
two-thirds. Two-thirds of those that claim to be Christian. And so our, our world is in a mess. But what about our churches? There's apostasy in churches. I, I, I hear so-called preachers and leaders and bishops. They, they come out. You see it on the news all the time. They're, they say these, these crazy things that, that have nothing, nothing based on the Bible whatsoever. Right? I've, I've seen bishops say that we, we, shouldn't think, we shouldn't think of Jesus as the Son of God. We, we shouldn't think of deity or, or miracles or, or any of those things. We ought to just see Jesus as a good man. That's a, a bishop in a church, a leader in a church. And so uh, all of these, all these false teachings are coming out of the churches. Churches are, are falling away, falling away from the truths of the Word of God. And then in the true churches, the ones that still hold to the truth, there's apathy in the pews. I've already said we're asleep a lot of times and, and we need to wake up, but it's, it's kind of like, yeah, I know, I, I know it's bad and, 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 and I know our, our church needs to do better, but you know what? Somebody will do it. Somebody will come along. Will they? What makes you think this church will be here 20 years from now? If we all just keep doing what we're doing, will it be? That's something to think about. And then another question is, what could I do right, as a member of this church? What could I do? to help make sure that this church is here 20 years from now. Because I promise you one thing, if somebody doesn't make an effort to keep the church alive, it will die. And so there's apathy in the pews. And so Paul in this passage of Scripture, he once again, he's calling us to action. He's calling the followers of Jesus Christ to wake up, to enter in to a new way of living, right? This time, Paul, is he's, he wants us to, to, to flash forward, right? We've, we've had this series of messages where we flash back, we've looked back to Jesus, we've looked back to his life, we've looked back to what Jesus did on the cross in order to, uh, to motivate us and to show us how we can live the way Jesus wants us to today. But in today's message, Paul is pushing our vision forward to the time when Jesus returns to motivate us to cast off the works of darkness, to wake up and to put on Jesus Christ, to clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ. And remember back in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, right? We are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, not being conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed into the life that Jesus wants us to live. And so Paul makes this, this clear call for us to to quit living like the world, to quit living with the, the, the desires of our flesh, to clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ himself. And so in view of God's mercy, we are to live our lives modeled after the life of Jesus Christ. And time and time and time again, we need to look back we need to flash back to Jesus and remember, oh yeah, he, he did it this way. He loved his enemies. He prayed for his enemies. He didn't, he didn't slash out at them. He, he didn't kill them. He didn't do anything to them mean. He only wanted them to come to faith. He loved them and he was patient with them. We need to learn to live the same way. But as we look forward... You know what? Jesus is coming back. 
Right? You believe that? When? When? Oh, Brother Gary, I, I know he's coming back, but man, that's, that's not going to happen my lifetime. It's going to be way, 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 way out there, right? I'm not so sure. And one thing Paul wants us to understand, right? He wants us to understand the time that we live in. And I think Paul also wants us to understand that it's a lot later than you think. It's a lot later than you think. And so Paul says that the hour has come, right? Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now, Paul's not... He's not talking there about our, our personal salvation when we, when we came to faith in Christ, repented of our sins, and put our faith in Him. But what Paul has in mind there when he says our salvation, what he means is the, the, the ultimate finish of our salvation, where we're, we're finally redeemed out of this world. Sin is, is taken out of our lives, and we're given these, these new bodies to, to live in heaven. What Paul is, Paul is saying that the completion of God's work for His children is very near. It's very near. Now, I know you're saying, well, yeah, yeah, preachers have preached that all my life. That still doesn't mean it's not true. Now, Paul's not telling us when Jesus is going to come back, but what Paul wants us to understand is we are to live as if He could come today. That's why... That's the way Christians are to live their lives. We are, we are to be expecting Jesus to appear in the sky at any minute. And we are to be doing and living the right way when He appears, right? And so Paul says, wake up. Wake up, right? We're to wake up to, to what's going on, to the way life is now, to wake up to the fact that Jesus is just around the corner. Wake up to the fact that there's a war going on and the devil's winning the war right now. The world is falling further and further and further away from God. And a lot of God's people are asleep. Wake up. Wake up. You know, some people have a hard time waking up in the morning. None of y'all, I'm sure, right? But some people have three or four alarm clocks and five or six snoozes set on each one of them, and they still can't get up. I always wondered why you do that to yourself. Why you stay in bed, stay in bed, stay in bed, and then you get up and you say, oh, man, I got to leave in three minutes. And then you run around and you forget half of everything and anyway. Paul said, there's a new day dawning. And it's time to get up. One Bible commentator said this, that only slackers would keep to their beds after the first glow of daylight. Early rising was especially necessary in the Middle East, where the bulk of the work needed to be done in the morning before the midday heat arrived. And Paul says, we don't have... Time. We don't have room in this spiritual war that God has called us to, to be sleeping in. It's time to get up, right? It's time to wake up. It's time to be alert. It's time to be eager. It's time to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Today, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, but today. And if we don't wake up, It's going to be too late. You know, we say we love Jesus, but we can't come to Jesus' church except once or twice a month or every once in a while or when it's convenient or when we don't have anything else to do. We say we love Jesus and we say we love our neighbors, but we never talk to them about Jesus. We never invite them to our church. We say we love Jesus, but we never read his letter. 
We say we love Jesus, but we never pray. We never seriously, we never seriously get involved in Bible study. We never get to the place where we can really dig into the deep things of the Word of God. We're really not in the fight at all, really. We're really just living our own lives most of the time. We're just doing our own thing, making our own money, doing whatever we want to do, and we show up when it's convenient at church more to satisfy our own conscience than to worship God. Wake up. Wake up. Are you going to lose it all? That's what Paul wants us to understand. The time is near. Be ready. Be ready. Paul says for us to be ready, we have to take off some stuff. 